Three Minute Thursdays, your source for animal rights news and gossip packed into a short, sweet three minutes on everyone's favorite day. It's a Thursday. It's the age old question, is it supply or demand? Do pressure campaigns just push animal use to other com companies or countries? Do long term pressure campaigns even work? Let's answer these questions and more as we look at the latest victory in the campaign against Air France. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 129. As always, hit that subscribe button, turn on the little bell notification to follow along on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We had a great month on Patreon. We're giving away over $6,000 to Positive Beginnings, which is a sanctuary for uh, foxes that have been rescued off of fur farms, which is such a cool idea, an amazing opportunity to help them out, so we took it. If you wanna join us, you can do so for as little as two bucks a month. Your donation is getting matched, so you're giving two, you're giving four actually, eight, 16, you know, you can do math. And season one of Radicals and Revolutionaries is of course over, but we are starting to release these little mini episodes, which are pretty cool. Uh, mini episode number one is uh, an interview I did with Mel Broughton a couple years ago. Uh, where he really went into big detail, like great detail, about how they uh, tried to liberate Rocky the Dolphin. So if you want to hear about how he was approached to do that action, um, what the plans were, how they practiced it, how they did the recon, what happened when they did the raid, and eventually what happened to Rocky the Dolphin and all dolphins inside of captivity in the UK, it's a great episode. It's short, it's like 20 minutes. Go check it out. Okay, we have talked a lot about pressure campaigns uh, for quite some time on this channel, let's be honest. And one of the biggest rebuttals uh, to it all is that if you stop or close one place, the animal use, it just goes to another company or even another country. So what's the point? Despite the fact that I think there is some strong irony in the fact that if it only took you 10 minutes to convince someone to go vegan for life, that roughly 12,000 new animal eaters are born in that same time span. I will begrudgingly give you a real world rebuttal based on a long-term pressure campaign. So of course the fights to stop the import and export of animals is waged on for quite some time, including for animal experimentation. But the Gateway to Hell campaign, it really kicked into gear in the early 2000s as a spin-off of the Shack campaign. So in order to throw the spanner in the gears of vivisection, the idea was to make it too difficult and expensive and too much of a headache to transport animals into labs, to attack the industry from all the different sides. So airlines became the natural target because back then, just about every commercial airline that you were flying had big crates full of primates, often caught in jungles, underneath your seat in the cargo hold. And they were being taken from their homes, sometimes labeled as like invasive species and flown around the world and put in laboratories to suffer awful fates and terrible deaths. So protests and disruptions and direct actions and letter writing and outreach started getting these airlines to capitulate. And they did so one after another, victory after victory. And the same tired response, to be frank, from a bunch of vegans came along with it. Another airline will just do it instead. What's the point? Let's just get people to go vegan, and that will in turn cripple a trillion dollar animal experimentation industry, and then the private trade will end. We'll, you know, we'll feed two birds with one scone. It was a strategic campaign. It was a strong pressure campaign. And while there were national groups involved in Stolar, um, groups like PETA, uh, the boots on the ground were, were the grassroots movement. They were the ones doing the, the, the dirty work. And there were grassroots communities around the globe working to end this practice. And it worked. It worked so well that there was really like only one big holdout left, which was Air France. Despite all the pressure from animal rights activists, they held out. A board of director for Air France apparently had worked in the pharmaceutical industry and gave the other board members a tour of a lab to show how great and important the research was. And so the board of directors decided to stick it out, which is where I want to take a quick pause for my first rebuttal. So a, a lot of time in pressure campaigns, if, if you can figure out that Achilles heel of a company, you can figure out where to squeeze the hardest. So for instance, in this case, you know, it seems like it was one person driving the company to stay in the primate transport game. So the question is, would it be harder to push that one person out of their board position and hopefully reverse Air France's position? Or would it be easier to create enough vegans to just end experimentation on primates? I'll let you decide. But anyways, the protests had stayed consistent over the years, but as of last week or so, Air France has announced that they will no longer transport primates to labs joining a list of every major airline in the world. So once all their contracts have expired, uh, which will happen before the end of the year, they're done. So the protests have now turned to two small airlines, Wamos or Wamos Air and Egypt Air, who are the last two standouts out of dozens and dozens and dozens of airlines from around the world. So how has this affected the vivisection industry? It's created major headaches 
and more importantly, it's kept primates out of labs. And here's rebuttal number two. According to science.org, the demand is increasing for primates in labs, but the supply is unable to meet it. Just wanna say that again. The demand is up, the supply is failing. So we hear an endless debate between it's the supply, no, it's the demand, including for me, fair enough. But this is just another in a hugely long string of examples over the past several years that show just how much demand there is for a product in a store or demand for food in the market or a primate in a lab. It just won't happen if there's a problem with the supply. The supply chains that even with our small movement, we are having the ability to mess up in really big ways. And here's rebuttal number number three, to the age-old criticism that the animal use will just shift to places that we can't protest against, like China. We hear that all the time. So a few things. That, that's just a fundamental misunderstanding of how we can protest globally to affect locally. Two, that totally invalidates and erases the work of animal activists in China, which there are a whole lot of. And, and three, you just never know what's going to happen, like, like in this situation, where China has banned the transport of all terrestrial animals out of the country. All of these different factors has drastically reduced the global supply of primates in labs. So this guy, Kirk Leach, who is the executive director of the European Animal Research Association, sounds like a fantastic organization. He painted a pretty bleak picture for them. And this is like an industry guy, right? And that's because of this sustained campaign. He suggests the only way around this issue is to try building breeding colonies around the world, which would be increasingly difficult and, and take well over a decade. But in the meantime, he says, quote, this shortage is going to drive out innovation from the sector. And, and take that how you like, right? But, but from an anti-vivisection animal rights activist, I read that more as, quote, this shortage is going to put an end to primate experimentation. But the takeaway from this Air France victory is that we have the ability to make change in big ways. We have the smarts and the creativity if we are able to stick it out for the long haul and that we can win by using pressure campaigns. It makes complete sense, right, that we wanna end all animal use as soon as possible. That's a given. And I think we look at vegan outreach as the quickest way to that goal. For every vegan there is, less animals are being killed. I, I get that, right? But that may be entirely true on paper, but it's just not working out that way in the real world. And that's where we're failing. And while I don't think that means we give up on outreach full stop, even though that's what a lot of people accuse me of thinking and saying, it's not true, I don't think that's what should happen. I do think we can bring meaningful and real world change to the lives of countless animals in labs and beyond and start to put an end to vivisection and other animal use industries if we campaign, if we are focused, if we are determined, and of course, if we keep fighting. Thank you.